We are thankful this morning that that morning came. We're thankful that years and years ago, the Son of God, Jesus Christ Himself, came to this earth as a man, fully God, yet fully man, fully human in flesh, and gave Himself for us. And you can imagine the darkness that the followers would have felt, those that believed Christ even in that day, that knew Him personally when He died, when His life ceased. But then three days after in the grave, as God had told us all along that His sacrifice would be His death, but that the joy would be the resurrection, the new life that Jesus displayed, the power over death in the grave. And so this morning, that's what we're going to discuss. Uh, I'll make no apology this morning. I'll just lay it out there. We're going to talk this morning about what it means to know the Lord, what it means to know God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, we believe this, and it is not right because we believe it. We believe it is right because it is from God's Word. I believe this is what God has taught us in the Bible. Now, I'm glad that each and every one of you are here and gathered with us today. There's many of you that I don't know, and I'd, I'd love to meet you and love to talk to you and, and, and get to know you in some way. And we have our church family, and today's a special day for our church family, not just because it's a holiday and not because it's a day that some people have set aside to see family or to celebrate in one way or another, but because we're gathered together today to celebrate the true resurrection of the God and Savior of our faith, Jesus Christ. Amen. That we are gathered together, not just those in person today, but uh, those that are part of this church, some that are watching online, some many that have traveled to see family this weekend and spend time with uh, those that they love. But no matter where we are, we love that we are bound together uh, through what Jesus has done in our lives and what we believe about the Bible telling us about God and about God's Son. I mentioned that last year we spent this day gathered virtually from our homes and uh, this past year has been challenging. It's been troubling in a lot of different ways. There's been disease and turmoil, attacks and unrest. There has been death. But I'm thrilled that as we gather this morning, we don't pretend as Christians that there is no death for us. We don't pretend as Christians that life somehow is different for us than it is for every other person, the 7.8 billion people on this earth. We face death the same way anyone else does. We've had the same threats, if you would, as anyone else this year, the same danger as anyone else physically. But what we take hope in is that our eternal hope in life, this life and in death, is found in Jesus Christ. We rejoice that we have eternal life promised through God's Son. And we come today together not by our own merit. Uh, we don't gather together to celebrate the resurrection because we are special or we have accomplished anything or our lives or our ch choices are in some way better than others. But we are gathered together because God Himself has said, come. He has said, mercifully, you can know me. You can be saved. You can be redeemed from your sins and I can work in your life. This is what we call the gospel. The word gospel, it's from an old Anglo-Saxon term, God spell, literally means the good story. The biblical term gospel is translated from a word that means the good news or the good telling. And so if you're a Christian this morning, my hope is that you will hear this good news this morning in a new way. Maybe not in a way that you haven't understood, but in a, a way that is afresh. Martin Lloyd-Jones, an old pastor, said that when a Christian hears the gospel, if it's presented in the right way, when a Christian hears the gospel, that their heart should be stirred to almost desire to receive it once again. Our hearts, our minds will be stirred by the gift of God that changes us not only once, but changes us day by day. And if you're a Christian this morning, my hope is that you will hear with an open mind and a heart. But if you're not a Christian this morning, if you're curious, if you're questioning, if you're asking questions about faith, if you would call it that, or religion. I hope that God will work in your mind and your spirit and that you can come to the place that you can believe for yourself. I hope that if you have never heard the gospel, my prayer is that this morning we may be able to present it in a way that you would understand. Uh, if you have heard the gospel, uh, but you haven't made it your own, it's not a decision that you have made personally. My hope is that God's spirit will move in your heart and life and, and, and push you, drive you, pull you to make it your own. 
If you're questioning, if you're curious, if you say, I don't even understand after today, I understand this is a big thought. There are people, we, we have sat in, there are people, we sit in church for years still trying to understand the full scope of the gospel and what it means. So I invite you, not just today, but if we can help you in your search for answers or as you seek through the Bible, I would encourage you as a church or myself, as a pastor, those that are here, we'd love to help you uh, see the truth, whether that is today or if it takes time, we'd love to establish that relationship with you. And so this morning, for a few minutes before we get into Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to look there and seek, see how we can seek a relationship with God personally. We're going to look there in a moment because I feel like Ephesians 2, in a brief and fairly simple way, explains what God has extended to us. It explains how God has reached out. We are all created by the same God, the one God that created all things. And He's extended something to us. He wants to have a real relationship with us now on this life, but also for eternity with our souls. And I feel like Ephesians 2 gives a good and brief explanation of the gospel, the good news, and what we mean by that. If you've been around church or around a Christian for any amount of time or watch certain things on TV or online, you may have heard the word salvation, saved, or born again, accepting Christ, assured, redeemed. So what do all these things mean? What is at the core of what we believe as Christians? For the next five, maybe ten minutes, I just want to explain what it is that we mean by the gospel. And then we're going to spend the end of our time together looking at Ephesians 2 and seeking to apply that to our lives. Everything that we believe, we try to take from the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. It's not that we have figured out some formula on our own to get to God. It's that God has chosen this way to communicate His nature, His character, and His plan for us as humans through His Word. So this morning I will quote John Newton. You may have heard the song Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, its author, he was preaching one day and speaking to his congregation, and it echoes my heart today. He says, I count it my honor and my happiness that I preach to free people who have the Bible in their hands. And it is to this Bible that we appeal. I entreat you and charge you to receive it, not, not to receive my word apart from what we find in the word of God. So this morning is not what I'm telling you, but it is what we have learned from God's word, what God tells us. The Bible tells us that there is one God that He created all that there is. There is nothing that you and I know apart from what was created or finds its beginning in God. God is everlasting. He has no beginning. Uh, it's hard for us to comprehend or even fathom, but He never didn't exist. And there will never be a time in all of history or in all of eternity that He will cease to exist. He's completely good. The Bible says He is absolutely righteous. He is holy, but He's also merciful. Everything that we have ever experienced in our lives is a gift from Him. God is worthy of all honor and glory in the universe. In fact, the Bible tells us that God created mankind, not just the first humans that He created, but all humans ever born in this world. He created them in His image. You and I are made in the image of God. What does that mean, that we are gods? No, but that we are pictures or examples intended to be a mirror, if you would, of what God is like here on this earth. We know that, that mankind, those first humans, and every human since has fallen short. We know that they failed God miserably. They chose to reject His words. God intended for mankind to have a communion and a relationship with Him. He created all men equal in their nature, but independent in their soul. He created everyone the same in who they are and how they react or what they are to Him, but He created us independent. Each of us has our own soul, and we decide what we will do with it in relation to our God. And Because of our sin, our lives are broken. Our relationship with God is broken. God gave mankind a law, the Bible says, but mankind is all, all of us, every single one of every human ever born, has broken God's law. And breaking it in part, we break it as a whole. And in breaking God's law, we do not bring glory to Him. He created us to love Him deeply. And in that love, display it by obeying Him. And yet we all choose to love ourselves. We choose other things. And we disobey God. And disobedience against God is sin. As it said in Ephesians 2, we are dead in our trespasses 
crossing the line of God's boundary. And we are dead in spiritually in our sins. God is absolutely righteous and absolutely holy. He created us, body, spirit, and soul. Our body is our flesh. Our spirit is the life that God gives us. It makes us unique or individual from other people. And then our soul is what makes us different from all the rest of creation. God created us with a soul that will live forever. Get this. God created all people with no end intended for them. He wanted to live with them in unity absolutely forever. That's the deep love of God towards people. But God is righteous and He cannot dwell with sin. He must judge and punish sin and wrath. I think we would understand this morning, that, like the Bible says, that we are all sinners. He loves all people, but He cannot excuse sin. He would cease to be good. He would cease to be righteous if He let sin go without judgment. God tells us that the punishment for sin is eternal separation. The wages, the payment, the punishment for sin is spiritual death. From, away from His favorable or loving presence and never-ending punishment for our rebellion against Him. And in our natural-born state, understand that this morning, the way that you're born into this world, you cannot change that. Not one person that has ever been born into this world can change the fact that they are a sinner. And you cannot change what you expect from God because of that sin. Meaning you cannot earn God's uh, release from your sin. You can't do enough to outweigh your bad deeds with your good deeds. It's, uh, the Bible says our righteousness is like filthy rags, meaning one part dirty contaminates the whole. Our lives are sinful before our God. And because of this, because we are standing guilty before God, every single one of us can expect eternal judgment for our sin. But we rejoice... If we were utterly left this way, we would be utterly hopeless forever. If God did not intervene, if we're born this way, we are sinners, we cannot be one with the God that created us, and we cannot change that ourselves. If God leaves us alone, that's the way that we are forever. We will die physically and ultimately spend spiritual, eternal death in hell forever. But we rejoice that we are not left to ourselves. The book of Romans tells us that the wages of sin is death. But it finishes that phrase by saying, but the gift of God is eternal life. That's pretty good options if you ask me. Your options are eternal death because of sin. Or God has said, here is eternal life. God has offered us a gift to every single man, woman, boy, and girl. Every person born into this world. God initiated a plan. We didn't come up with this on our own. We didn't go to God and say, God, you know, if, if things work out this way, if we did this, would you be happy? God said, I love you so deeply, I am going to work out a way. I have a plan in mind. I am going to redeem you from your sins. This plan was not, it's not a list of rules to obey. That would be unfortunate because we could not do it. If God said, do these things, even do these five or ten things, and you can earn my salvation, we would never do it. It's not a religion. There's a lot of religions that form some sort of belief system or some sort of way to approach God by works. It's not a denomination or a church that you have to join or be a part of. His plan for our souls does not involve any sort of penance or punishment or payment that we can make for our sins. You could not bear it. It'd be like walking into the car dealership and picking the most expensive car and offering a $10 bill and expecting to walk out just with the keys. It can't happen. What you have to offer falls so short of what God would expect for the punishment of sin. There's no way you could ever offer it. God sent His Son. That was His plan. God promised the very first people who sinned that one day a man would come to defeat the punishment of sin, that this man would not just be a special person, but that it would be himself, it would be his son sent to this earth to live the way that God intended men to live in the first place. And so he sent his son, his name was Jesus. He was born of a virgin, not with a, a, an earthly mother and father, but he was born miraculously, sent by God himself. He is God the Son, eternally existent, fully God, fully man. Hard to comprehend, isn't it? He never sinned. He never broke God's law. 
He came. He lived lovingly. He taught truthfully. He taught people what God intended for the world. He taught what salvation meant and uh, what salvation was from sin and how it affected eternity. He taught, just like the rest of the Bible, that the punishment for sin is death. But Jesus never sinned. And so out of all the things in the world that Jesus experienced as a human being, it says he laid aside, he didn't cease to be God, but he laid aside some of the nature or the benefits of being God in a celestial heavenly way and came as earth. He restricted himself to the body of a human, experienced things just like we do, but he never sinned. So the one thing that Jesus never had to experience as a human being by right was death. He didn't have to die. The wages of sin is death, and he never sinned, so he didn't have to die, but he chose to willingly. The Bible teaches us that he came, that he lived perfectly, and that he was made sin for us. The punishment for our sins, as we sang a moment ago, was laid on him. Human beings took him and tortured him and nailed him to a cross, and he died there. His body stopped functioning just like anyone else's would in death. His heart stopped to beat, his lungs ceased to breathe. His body physically ceased to live. He gave up his life. It wasn't taken from him. He gave it willingly. Why? If Jesus had no sin in him, that means death was a choice. It was a sacrifice, not a necessity, not a punishment. And he remained dead for three days, bearing the sin, the guilt, the shame, the weight of our sins, the Bible says, of the sins of every other human being were laid on him. So Jesus, not only did he die, but he absorbed or he took on the wrath of God towards sin. All of hell or all the punishment, all the anger or the, or the righteous wrath that God had toward sin was laid on the perfect sinless one, Jesus Christ. He took that and in death he died like a sinner, not as a sinner, but like a sinner would die. But because he had not sinned, his death was different than everyone else's. The Bible tells us in each of the Gospels and throughout historical context and different accounts that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Because on that third day, sin and death had no real hold or claim to him. He died to display that love, then rose to display that he could conquer death, that he was above sin, that he was not held or bound by it like all of the rest of the human beings in the world. He rose from the dead and he Rose, his physical body was raised to new life. His heart began to beat. He began to breathe again. And he lived physically. And he showed his body again to his disciples and to well, says hundreds of witnesses throughout the month after his death. Eventually, Jesus went in his physical body to live in the presence of God the Father. And he left his followers. This is what we call Christians. He left these Christians to share the gospel, as we have just explained it, to a world that is in need. The offer that if someone repents and turns from the natural state of their sin, not to become good, but to trust His goodness. Not to change their lives to be totally, perfectly righteous, but to trust Jesus is perfect and totally righteous. If we will turn from our sin and trust that Jesus' sacrifice for us is fully completed and fully accepted by God the Father, then you too can be raised to new life. And though we may face a physical death just as Jesus rose from the dead, God will raise us up in our souls and our spirits, and we are promised a new body and eternal life with Him. You say, that sounds crazy. And get this, it is. To our own physical minds and to what we understand, we are so skewed and scoured by our sin that it does sound crazy. It does sound wild and insane that God would ever work it out. Why would He do this thing this way? Because God intended all along to glorify Himself by how He loved His children, by how He loved those that were in the world. So your place this morning... You will live, all of us will live one day forever, somewhere and in some way, either in the loving presence of God in a place called heaven or in the punishment and the wrath of God in a place called hell. Get this this morning, your place in heaven and hell has nothing to do with the actions of your life. 
It has nothing to do with the story of your past. It has nothing to do with the physical life that you have lived or experienced. It has nothing to do with things that you have gained or amassed. It has nothing to do with what you have done, the good or the bad deeds. None of that has any bearing on whether you go to heaven or hell. Because you can't earn it yourself. As the Bible has called it several times, it is the gift of God. So look at Ephesians chapter 2, if you would, this morning, just for a few minutes. And I explained that very brief explanation of the gospel this morning. There's no way that in, in this amount of time that we have this morning, unless we stayed here for what would seem like days on end, and sometimes our congregation may feel that way, uh, unless we stayed here for that length of time that I could explain or show you all the facts and the proofs biblically and historically that this is what God has intended and this is the story of Jesus and it is true. But I can in this amount of time extend you the grace that God has given, the grace that God has offered you. So that's what we want to do this morning. The book of Ephesians was written by a man named Paul, the Apostle Paul as we would call him. It's written to Christians at a church that was in a city called Ephesus. That's why it's called Ephesians. And as we read Ephesians 2, what you're going to notice is that he's writing to people who believe in God. He's writing to people that already believe in Jesus Christ. So as you see this, he's going to talk about what God has done and what has happened in their lives because he's writing to people that are already Christians. And as he's writing to them that are already Christians, he's doing it and he's explaining the gospel in a deeper way to them. Here is what God has done in you and here is what God can do in the lives of those around you. So don't be fooled when you read and it says, here's what he has done and here's what has happened in your life. That same grace that he speaks of is extended to every single one of us this morning. It was extended to those that lived in Ephesus. And if you're a Christian this morning, it has been extended to you and you can receive this portion of this letter the same way that those that lived 2,000 years ago received it. That this is what God has done for you and this is what God can do in others through you. If you're questioning, if you're curious, if you haven't made this decision this morning, you can know that the same hope and mercy and grace and love that is explained in Ephesians 2 is offered to them, but it's also offered to you today. And that's my prayer, that as we look at these 13 verses, we just simply organize our minds for a moment on what the Bible is telling us here. I want to be as simple as we can this morning. So let's start with these two words. Ephesians 2 takes two words that sort of leap off the page for us. And I want to highlight them for you, if you will. Look in verse number 1. It says, and you. Okay, so he, he, he says very, very plainly, right at the very beginning, this is about you. So these first three verses, he says, and you. So let's establish that. Here's the first word, very clearly, that leaps off. Here's a description of you. And then look at verse number four. It says, but God. So there's the other subject. The other thing that's going to be described is God. And so he says here in Ephesians 2, here is you. And then he says, here is God. And he's going to give us a description. Here is what you are like, and here is what God is like. Here is, he's going to make it very clear. There is a separation between the two. You are not like him, and he is not like you. Your life has suffering and sin and is hopeless. His life is love and mercy, and he extends that hope. And you cannot come to him on your own. But he has come by grace to you. So let's look at the description, if you would, for a moment. What does he say about first? What does he say about you? And when I say you this morning, I don't mean in a demeaning way, just at you individually. It's all of us as people. So when he says you, he means mankind. I want you to notice what he says about you, about us this morning. He says first that we are dead. Verse number one, he says, In you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. This is not something that we want to hear. In fact, it's not something that most of us will ever hear in our lifetime, right? Because by the time that you hear this, you're not here to hear it. And so when he says you are dead, he is not speaking to these living people and saying you're dead, you just don't know it. He is not speaking about their physical lives, obviously. He says you're dead in trespasses and sins. He says in the acts that you have committed against God, in your rebellion against God, the fact that you cannot glorify Him, the fact that you are not like Him, you are not perfect, you have sin. In your sin and in those trespasses, the crossing of that line that God has set up for you, you are dead. 
meaning you are spiritually dead. It is not that you're born into this world saved and you lose that salvation. You are born into this world with a deep and great need to be saved. Those who have not believed in the gospel, he says here, are living physically, but they are dead spiritually. Those of us that are Christians, if you're saved this morning, you are dying physically, but alive spiritually. The second thing it describes us, it says, number one, you're dead. Number two, you're of this world. Where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, which may not seem like a dark description of us. Of course, we all live on this earth. We all live in this life. But the problem is he's saying you're completely anchored in this world. All good that you think about, every hope that you have, every satisfaction that you've ever gained, every pleasure and joy that you've ever experienced, if you are not in Christ, if you have not been saved from your sins, this world is all the good that you can expect. I don't know if you've noticed, the world is not the best place. And so he says, if you are dead in your sins, then this life is all that you have to look forward to. And obviously, this life is not guaranteed. So he says, if you are dead spiritually, you are of this world, and you have no hope beyond it of yourself. He says, all that is on this earth, everything that will matter in this life that we think matters will fall away. And the only thing that will matter is whether we trusted and established a relationship with God, our Creator. We're all appointed, it says, once to die. We're all headed toward the end of a physical life. But he says, if that's the case, you are dead spiritually. You are locked into this world. A third description of us or of you says that we are disobedient. It says in the end of verse 2 that the spirit that now worketh in us, the children of disobedience, and without changing and God working in us, our hearts are disobedient toward Him. And you may think, well, I've tried to obey. I've tried to do good things. I've tried to follow God's law or the Ten Commandments or do what is right. Or you may think, I've done good things. I've gone to church enough. I've done the good Christian list. But none of those things appease God's wrath. None of them earn our way to God. And our righteousness, as we mentioned, is like dirty rags. It contaminates the whole. Why is our whole life amounting to disobedience toward God? If that's the case, you say, well, I'm trying to do good. Because God has first commanded us in His Word. Before we can ever try to do good for Him, to bring glory to Him, He says, first, you must trust and believe in the gospel. First, you must take the gift that I have given. Then I will change you and work in your life. And until we do that, everything that we do before God is disobedience. He says that we're dead, we're of this world, we're disobedient. Look at the fourth and last thing he says about us. He says we're the children of wrath. He describes that in, in verse number three, and we're by nature the children of wrath. Some people speak or they say that we're all children of God, but the Bible doesn't actually teach this. Except in Acts 17, it says the scope that we're all created by him, but we are not all just born in this world, God's children. We're born the children of Adam. Children, generally, the description here is that they receive something. They're descendants, their inheritance. They get something from their caretakers. And he says, without God, what you are going to get is wrath. Without God working and saving in your life and without your sin being paid for by Jesus Christ, what you're going to receive because of that sin is the wrath of God. But to this point, you say, what a great Easter message. This is the part of the gospel that is void of joy, void of happiness. The part that is not enjoyable to think on, that my sin leads to spiritual death. But this is the portion of the gospel that can cause our minds to feel guilt and dread for our future. But we rejoice that it's only part of the gospel. Because it wouldn't be the gospel if it ended here. It would not be good news if we stopped in verse number 3 as children of wrath. But he goes on and he says in verse 4, But God, who is, look at the things, look at how it describes God. He says, You are dead, you are of this world, you are completely lost, you are children of wrath, you are disobedient. But God, what is He? Verse number 4, He is rich in mercy. You may not realize it this morning, but God has overwhelmingly given you mercy by not giving us what we deserve. If you're a Christian this morning, you must dwell and remember what you deserve without Him. The almighty wrath and punishment for sin that we could 
count on, that we could know is ours, and we would do well to think on the mercy of our God. If you're not a believer yet this morning, I want you to know that God is a God who created you, and He is abounding in mercy. He has brought you to this point in your life. He has extended you this grace. Why? Because of the second description, he says, number one, I'm rich in mercy. Number two, he has great love. Not only is he merciful, but he has deep love toward you. That word for love is agape, means pure love and goodwill, unconditional love toward a subject, regardless of their condition or of the circumstance. Aren't you glad that God cannot, will not change his love toward you based on who you are or what you've done? Get this, we say it often, God cannot love you any more, and He absolutely will not love you any less. So there's nothing you can do on this earth to earn the love of God. He already deeply, deeply loves you in perfect way. He is rich in mercy. The second description, He is great with His love. Number three, He makes alive. Look, if you would, at verse number five, even when we were dead in sins, He has quickened us. He has made us alive together in Christ. It's great that God is not just rich in mercy and of great love. He can do something about it. Because there are people that I love that when they get a disease, I love them, but my love doesn't save them. I'm merciful and pitiful, compassionate towards someone that is suffering, but my compassion can't always change their suffering. But aren't you glad this morning that in the description it says of God, you are hopeless, lost, devoid of good, disobedient, and stuck in this world with wrath to come. But God loves you and is merciful, and He has the power to do something about it. He says, I'm going to make you alive together with Christ. If you feel this morning that your soul is without hope, you can know from what the Bible tells you that God can make you alive. Fourth thing, He says, He raises up. Verse number 6, He says, He has raised us up together and made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ. So He is merciful, He loving, He makes us alive. And another description of that, He has raised us up. The same way that we celebrate Jesus died and then was raised to new life, God extends that to you. You will die. But if you are in Christ and in His mercy and in the love of God, He will raise you up. He will extend and give you eternal life. Physical death will simply be a moment that transmit you or send you into your eternal life with God. And then look at the final description of the Lord here in verse number 7. It says that in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness. He is kind. He's merciful. He's loving. He loves you deeply. He wants to make alive. He can raise people to new life because He is strong. He is kind. He is perfect. He is holy, He is loving, He is merciful. God, here's what He's establishing. Here is you, and here is God, and there is a massive divide between you. None of the descriptions are the same. You say, well, I do good things. God is good. You say, I think good things. God is good. I want to try to be right. God is perfect and right. You cannot be like Him on your own. You can't make Him happy. You can't appease Him on your own. This is the, des- the description that God has given of Himself. I'm not sure what you thought of God before today, but here is what God wants you to know about Him. That He is merciful, that He loves you, that He is kind, and He desires and has the power to change you, to work in your life, and to promise you eternal glory with Him. And that brings us to the final verse this morning. Verse number 8. How do we get from being you to being with God? How do you get there? How is that massive divide and chasm going to be bridged? How is it ever going to be brought together? How can my wickedness ever be lost in God's righteousness? How can that happen? Very first two words of verse number 8. By, for by grace. Only by grace. There is no other way. There are times that we can quickly skip over that part and read it. For by grace you say, through faith. And we immediately want to focus on the faith first. 
in counseling or in talking to people about salvation or witnessing, or if I'm speaking to someone that is unsure if they're saved or not, the questions always come up. Did I say the right things? Did I pray the right way? Did I do the right things? Did I change enough? Did I mean it the way that I should have meant it? We focus on the through faith, skipping over the by grace. It doesn't say you're saved by grace and faith. It says you're saved by grace through faith. So let's stop for a moment and focus on the grace. Because it's not about how much you mean it or how good your faith is. That's simply the avenue by which you receive God's grace. It is God's grace that saves. Grace and nothing added. It is the first and last cause of our salvation. The sacrifice of Jesus, His death and resurrection to new life is the ultimate display of God's grace. And it is the only reason that you can be saved this morning. Our faith, your faith, is futile and useless without God's grace. You must realize this morning that you are saved by grace and grace alone. So you can ask the question all you want. Did I do it right? Did I believe enough? Uh, those are the wrong questions. Because here's why. You can't do it right. And you can't believe enough. You can simply believe. It is His grace that is sufficient. It is His grace that it is enough. Not your faith in His grace. That's the avenue. So what is grace? We could go again for an hour or two on this. We won't this morning. I'm going to give it to you in just a paragraph by how the Bible describes it. And you could give a big definition of grace, but here, is it, here it is as simple as you can from the text. What is grace? Notice this. You can underline, mark these words, memorize them in your mind. What is grace? It is not of yourselves, not of works, the gift of God. That's the description that he gives. What in the world is God's grace to me? I can't explain to you this morning all those things in this amount of time, all that God's grace is, but I can tell you this. Here's what it is. It's not of your works. It's not from what you can do. It is a gift from God. It is his possession to offer to you, not your way to earn it from him. So if grace is not of works, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. There's a lot of substitutions that people have tried throughout the years to make for grace. People have tried to say, for by religion you're saved, by good works you're saved, by graciousness, by your kindness toward others and the way you display love to others, that's how you're saved. By your guilt, if you feel bad enough about your sin, then you can be saved. By your sincerity, if you mean it enough, you can be saved. But it doesn't say any of those things. They're all false substitutes that will not save you. It says, by grace alone are you saved. And then that leads us to the final little section of words here. Notice this morning, the other word, you're saved by grace through faith. God initiates the gift. Grace is poured out and it is simply accepted through faith. We speak sometimes of faith as our the whole of our belief system. That's not what it's saying here. Not by grace through your religious faith. Not by grace through your denominational faith. Not by grace through your system of faith. By grace through the faith of your heart and your mind toward Him and the promise that He has extended to you. It is God saying, here is who I am and here is what I give to you. It's not the moral excellence of your faith and it is not the quality of your faith that saves you. It is the righteousness of Jesus received by faith. I've heard explanations of faith that leave me more confused than when I started. And I hope that that won't be the case this morning, but let me do the same thing we did with grace, a very short explanation. Let me explain to you what it means by faith. This is, this is not original with me. I came across it somewhere, and it's been very helpful to me, so I'll extend it to you. Here's elements of faith, and here they are. There is knowledge, belief, and trust. And true faith seems to have all of those. It starts with knowledge. You can't have faith in something you don't know. It doesn't mean that you have to know the ins and outs of everything in the whole world. I believe that not too far from here, just a hundred so miles or so, I believe there's a group of people that can launch a rocket into space. But I have no idea exactly how it works. I believe in faith. Why? Because I know I've seen it. I've read about it. I've even watched it. I know that it happens. 
but I don't know all the ins and outs. I didn't have to describe it. So I see the rocket going through the sky, but first I'm going to need to become a rocket scientist before I decide if I believe this is true or not. I see it, and so I have to know that something has happened. And this morning, hopefully, you would be able to say, I have a general knowledge or an understanding. Romans 10, 14 says, How shall they believe in Him of whom they had not heard? Hopefully this morning you could say, I have heard of Jesus. I have heard of the gospel. I know. And let me tell you this morning, Christian, anyone in your life that you ever desire or hope that they would know Jesus, if you ever hope that someone that you love that is a family, friend, co-worker, neighbor, if you ever desire to see anyone saved, they must hear it. They must know it. They won't have faith if they've never heard. And so faith starts with a knowledge, but then it moves to belief. Because there's a lot of people, millions of people have heard and know what the gospel is. But they haven't believed it. And once you know the gospel, believe it. Believe the truth that Jesus came and is God and Savior. Believe that only He can redeem by grace. Believe that Jesus' sacrifice is complete and fully accepted by God. Believing is a, is, a, is a power word today, isn't it? I don't think we've ever watched a Disney movie that didn't tell me to believe. <laughs> if you believe enough, you know, coaches you know, talking to their teams. A couple games yesterday, one team's getting blown out by 500 points is what it feels like. You know, the coach is in the huddle saying, just believe. And th that's not what it's saying here. It's not saying just earnestly, emotionally hope. It's saying from what you know that God has extended, you believe and accept that as truth. And that leads to the final thing. It leads to trust. Because there's a difference between believing and trusting. And that's what makes it complete in faith. Again, it's not how good your faith is. It's not how much you do. But it starts with, I know what I've heard, and I understand it. I believe that it's true, and now I trust it. What is trusting? It is me committing myself to the merciful God, resting my hope on His gracious gospel. It is, the word means to lean completely on. And this morning, if you are leaning on anything else for your salvation, it will fail. It will break. It will snap eventually. But God says, by faith, what I know, and what I believe, and what I lean on. That is what brings me to the grace of God. So God is sending His grace to you. And you, what, how, how do I get to Him? You don't. By faith, you understand and know. You believe and you lean completely on that. And then through the cross of Christ, His sacrifice and His resurrection and His life, He brings you and God together. And I want to ask you this morning, has this ever happened in your life? Faith is not blind. It begins with knowledge. Faith is not a speculative hope. It, be, it is believing. It is sure. Faith is not impractical or dreamy. It trusts. It stakes its destiny on the truth of God. Salvation is by grace. The gift of God offered to you. Salvation by grace alone is accepted through faith. All that God requires of you is to hear His truth, believe it, repent, turning, totally leaning on what He has promised and His Word will save you. So Christian this morning, may the grace of God humble you. Non-Christian this morning, may the grace of God save you by faith. Verse 12 and 13 say that at the time we were without Christ. I wonder if that's some of us this morning. Some of us can say we're without Christ. We have never wholly leaned and trusted into this gospel. He says, without Christ, you have no hope, and you're without God in this world. But now in Christ Jesus, in Christ alone, as we sang a moment ago, and as we'll sing again as an invitation in a moment, in Christ alone, you are far off, way over here, but only by grace you're brought near. Every head bowed and every eye